Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this Chatham House uh, event webinar um, on uh, issues around China's sovereignty and the community of shared destiny, the language it's, um, the government's been using for a number of years now. So it is good to be joined today by two colleagues um, uh, who will be discussing this issue with me, Bill Hayton, who's been an associate on the Asia Pacific program uh, at Chatham House for a number of years, and my other colleague, Harriet, running home. So um, if I might invite Bill to make some intro introductory comments, and then Harriet will uh, follow. So, Bill. Great. Thank you very much. Um, I thought I'd maybe just begin by sketching out why I'm talking about China and sovereignty today. I, I work mainly on Southeast Asia, but that led me into the South China Sea, and that led me into the history of China's claim making in the South China Sea during the 20th century. And then that led me into other forms of claim making uh, during China's nation building process uh, in the late 19th and early 20th centuries and how they continue to affect the region today. Um, and so the book is called The Invention of China, but I prefer, I think academics might prefer I talked about construction. So the selective remembering and forgetting of, uh, of bits of information in order to construct a coherent narrative. And I'll try and talk maybe a bit today about how present actions uh, by China circle back a bit to this sort of nation building process. Um, so the, um, I'm going to start with a um, uh, speech that uh, Xi Jinping made to the UN General Assembly uh, last month. Um, and he used this phrase, uh, common future or a shared future, uh, three times during that relatively short speech. Um, which I think gives us some sense that it's um, becoming a, a, a slogan of, of choice uh, for, the, for the Chinese leadership. Um, but I'm also, well, I've just uh, read uh, this new book by Jing Hanzhen of uh, the University of Lancaster, um, when he talks about slogan politics and uh, these empty slogans which are used by the Chinese leadership. Um, it's a very useful account of how the slogan emerged from its first uses in reference to Taiwan, the idea of a, a community of shared future sometimes translated as community of common destiny, but shared future seems to be the, the present favorite. Um, to the point where it's been enshrined in constitutions, both of the Communist Party and of the, the Chinese state as well. But um, Dr. Zeng's conclusion is that uh, it's an empty concept waiting to be filled. So my question is really, how is this empty concept uh, going to be filled or how might it be filled? I mean, it may well be that there's no direct connection between China's slogans and its real world actions. They may be in two entirely separate processes. One can imagine experts in universities thinking about slogans while diplomats and other ministerial officials get on with policy. However, I think it's likely that the slogan may acquire meaning through China's real world actions. The, the empty slogan may be filled. Um, and so I just wanted to think about how we think about uh, the organizing principles behind China's foreign policy behavior, if indeed there are any. And we've generally seen, I think until recently, China's foreign policy actions as linked directly to its own interests, to regime security, fending off uh, political pluralism or human rights criticism, uh, territorial integrity, thinking about the South China Sea, the East China Sea, Taiwan and the Himalayas or perhaps defending its overseas interests, whether they be uh, monitoring sea lanes with an overseas base in Djibouti or evacuating Chinese citizens in Libya. But I think we're seeing now moves into the principles of global governance itself. In June 2018, President Xi called for China to take an active part in leading reform of the global government system, for example. So how can we get some clues about what the organizing beliefs are um, behind China's views on global governance. And I think one telling example is the question of climate change. Um, if we go back to December 2009, the leaders of most of the world's countries were gathered in Copenhagen to try and seal an international agreement on the climate crisis. And developed countries had pledged uh, to cut their emissions and to spend billions on helping poor to cut theirs. Um, but they wanted the jargon to be, sorry, they wanted the deal to be in the jargon, measurable, reportable, and verifiable. And this was the deal breaker. So you had this meeting with uh, the leaders uh, where they refused to compromise. And people who were in the room say that it was this formula of measurable, reportable, and verifiable that was unacceptable. And it was China that had the most objections. But 
six years later, the countries in Paris, uh, same countries, managed to reach an agreement on climate. And the difference was that the wording about measuring, reporting and verifying had been removed. And in its place, we had nationally determined contributions. So each country would set its own target for reducing carbon emissions. It would be voluntary and there could be no enforcement agency to compel any agent and any government to act. And it seems to be remarkable that China had delayed an international agreement on climate change for six years in order to make sure that it couldn't be forced by an outside power to do something that it wanted said that it wanted to do anyway. And I think my conclusion from this, it was that it was the principle of sovereignty uh, that was the, the non-negotiable part. Um, it didn't want to be told what to do by people from, from outside. Um, and when um, Xi Jinping talked about, uh, in his, gave his talk to uh, the UN General Assembly, he put front and center the idea that, these, uh, that China was going to cut its emissions based on this idea of these um, uh, non-verifiable but nationally determined uh, carbon uh, reductions. Um, and it seems that in his, in his speech there, he was also talking about multilateralism in a very specific and rather neutered way but, and also rejecting, his, in his words, rejecting attempts to build blocks to keep others out. So it seems that there's no space here for alliances or groupings of smaller or medium-sized states who wish to band together to protect their interests, nor is there space for a shared sovereignty where states uh, police one another's um, behavior. Um, and I think this brings me a bit back to the, the topic of history and, 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 um, and my book. And in chapter two, I look at the adoption of ideas of sovereignty uh, in the Qing states during the late 19th century. And I draw on the work of, of plenty of other academics who have gone there before me. Um, and the word that was chosen to represent the English word sovereignty in Chinese back then was uh, Zhu Quan, um, which does have some ancient roots, but it was adopted deliberately as an equivalent by this fellow, William Martin, a Presbyterian missionary and translator who chose uh, the Chinese word Zhu Quan uh, to represent the word sovereignty, um, but um, it was never quite, it, it was never a direct translation. Uh, Zhu Quan had other meanings which were not represented by sovereignty and, and, and vice versa. The word, the reason he did this was because he was translating this book, an 1836 book by an American lawyer called Henry Wheaton, The Elements of International Law. Um, and he was trying to introduce the Qing court to these Western ideas about sovereignty. And this was a period marked by the loss of the Qing's uh, tributary straits. So the Ryukyu Islands, Korea, Vietnam, Laos, uh, Burma and Siam had all broken away in a period between the 1860s and the 1890s. Um, I think it's important here to think about what the tributary system kind of meant in terms of uh, for, the, for the importance of its importance for the Qing state. That it was it was not an economically profitable arrangement that these states would come and offer tribute to the empire. It was, however, politically vital. It was a form of political legitimacy that the fact that these delegations would come from overseas and recognize the emperor's rule conferred him in his position on the throne. Um, so to cut a very long story short, these ideas about sovereignty and, uh, and tribute states and uh, the New World Order back then were strongly debated uh, in the upper echelons of the Qing state. Um, and in particular, the statesman Li Hongzhang tried to use them to defend the empire's interests against Western power. And he tried to fuse traditional notions of power with new ideas of sovereignty. And in particular, it was him who gave he had the idea that Zhu Quan had a kind of moral force rather than merely a legal one. Um, which in some ways kind of twists the, the Western meaning, which was actually about trying to break the idea of some kind of God-given order and make it more earthly. Um, cutting the story even shorter, so it brings us to Wang Runin, um, the sort of brain behind Xi Jinping, uh, sits on the Standing Committee of the Politburo, he's been a long-standing theoretician. Um, now, as a, a law professor at Fudan University, uh, his first book uh, was entitled National Sovereignty, and in it he claims that China had invented the idea of sovereignty um, and thereby overlooked the 19th century translation. Um, so Wang has very specific ideas about national sovereignty, um, and given his position at the apex of Chinese power, it might be interesting just to 
speculate on what his version of a new world order or next world order might look like. And it seems to be a state in which countries stand on their own and make their own way in their system, in the international system as individuals. It seems to be a vision in which big countries matter more than small or medium sized ones. And it could, one would argue, fit neatly with the idea of a, of a regional hierarchy, one in which Beijing sits at the top and others um, uh, join in, but they have to know their place and seems to therefore echo aspects of an old tributary system whereby uh, the performance of these rituals of coming to Beijing or not, and, or Beijing sitting at the top and un, un, uninspectable, unimpeachable um, state uh, and a system where uh, other states act uh, as uh, as tributary states, in effect, um, seem to uh, reinforce domestic legitimacy uh, with for the the ruling group within China. So, in that sense, I can I'm, I'm cutting a, a much more complex story rather short, but it does seem to be a sort of way of trying to appeal back to 19th century ideas um, about uh, the role of regional hierarchies the importance of, uh, of tribute systems and so forth, um, and seems to place sovereignty at the, at the very heart of what China's idea for a, a world order should be. I'll stop there. Great, thank you very much, Bill. So now if I could invite my colleague, um, Harriet Renihan, to um, say a few words. Thank you, Kerry. Um, well, congratulations first to Bill on his book, which I have read, had the pleasure of reading already, and. Um, it really does make, I think, a very original contribution uh, to the history of China. And I think, I think it's fascinating and has a lot of really interesting detail, which must have taken a lot of work. So congratulations. And I hope many of you will uh, go out and read it. Um, I'm basically going to discuss sovereignty and China in the context of international law, which is the area that I work on in the international law program at Chatham House. Um, and a little bit about the, also the, uh, common shared future of mankind concept from the perspective of international law as well. And as Bill said, uh, in the 19th century, the uh, international law itself was introduced to China from the West. And um, Bill referenced Wheaton's book. And, and that concept of international law included sovereignty, in particular, territorial sovereignty. And the way in which sovereignty is understood in international law is a, about a state's exclusive authority over its own territory, um, independent from any other states, and also that states are equal in the international legal order. So they may not be equal in fact, but in terms of international law, they are equal. And so there's an important status of, of equality there, and also the principle of independence. And as Bill has alluded to, the principle of sovereignty is very important to China ever since the establishment of the PRC in 1949. Sovereignty has been a key theme that's emerged in international legal discourse, including the five principles of peaceful coexistence in 1954, which China frequently refers to and which um, highlight the importance of sovereignty and its cousin, the principle of non-intervention in the internal and external affairs of other states. Um, and those um, principles are also not just international law concepts for China, they're, they're the cornerstone of China's foreign policy, uh, as, as Bill's mentioned. And I don't think that it's particularly surprising, given the history that Bill uh, carefully sets out in his book, that China places so much emphasis on sovereignty and non-intervention, because China's history is one of uh, occupation for uh, hundreds of years by the Qing dynasty and by others, and therefore, the, uh, there's a real attraction to uh, a concept that promotes the independence of the state, that promotes the sanctity of territorial borders and the idea that um, other states shouldn't interfere in internal affairs. So we kind of can see where this is coming from and the attraction to China. Sovereignty is also related to national security. It's about, as I say, exclusive authority and other states not being able to come in uh, and, and um, I suppose, put their own views and promote their own norms, whether it be democracy or human rights. Um, it's about the integrity of the state. So I think China uh, sees it as, as very attractive, um, especially having been colonized. And I think many states that are formerly, uh, co former colonial, colonial um, vassals, as it were, tend to place a lot of emphasis on sovereignty and non-intervention. So we see it a lot in the global south as well. But there's a really interesting tension in China's emphasis on sovereignty 
um, at the same time as China's desire to go out into the world and take a more active role in global governance. Because of course, international cooperation on glo global governance requires some kind of trade-off of sovereignty. If a state enters into a multilateral treaty with binding obligations versus other states, then there is a, a ceding of sovereignty. And the way in which I think China tries to navigate this tension is by being quite selective um, about um, ceding sovereignty in certain areas where there are collective benefits, in particular international economic governance. We see, for example, China happy to participate in the uh, dispute settlement mechanism of the WTO. Um, China is actually one of the most active participants of bringing cases before the WTO and also defending cases, and that's an independent body. So China ceded its sovereignty in that sense. But China fiercely clings on to sovereignty in relation to its core interests, including, as we know, territorial integrity at areas where it's asserting its, its territorial boundaries and also in relation to human rights. So international economic governance, we can almost sort of see as a certain area where, again, China is very active now in international arbitration. So again, happy to see to independent arbiters where previously it was not. Um, but, but then there are certain areas where sovereignty uh, prevails. And coming on to one of the most prominent areas of international law in which we see China's sovereigntist approach, human rights law. Um, China has signed up to most of the major international human rights law instruments, um, of the big UN treaties, but China tends to see human rights as state to state matters um, about managing state obligations um, and not as the relationship between the state and in the individual. And, and just going back to history, it could be argued that uh, China could argue that, um, in fact, does argue that the previous occupation has informed China's view that it needs its, its sort of sovereign independence in order to guarantee basic rights. And that culturally China, as we know, as many of you know, will um, tend to place emphasis on economic and social rights and a collective welfare of the state, rather than a relationship between the state and the individual, which is how the West tends to conceive of human rights. So there's a different way of seeing human rights and there is an emphasis on human rights, but through a sovereigntist perspective, which sometimes means that China in fact sidelines human rights. And one example of that um, is the joint declaration between China and Russia on the promotion of international law in 2016, which lays a lot of emphasis on sovereignty and the principle of non-intervention, but doesn't mention human rights at all. Um, we're also seeing in the realm of tech governance, um, China promulgating the concept of cyber sovereignty, which is really about China controlling access to the internet through the Great Firewall and having a lot of control about the personal data of the individuals within its state. Um, and that we're seeing at the UN debates on cyber governance and on cyber security, a real push by China and Russia and like-minded states at the expense of a, of a sort of open internet. And, and that's actually leading to a real split, a splinternet as it's called, in terms of um, how the internet um, should, be, should be run um, and a rights-based approach. Um, so I'm just gonna leave that there on sovereignty, but touch briefly, if I may, on the common shared future of mankind and international law. As Bill has said, this is essentially a concept which seems to be much about discourse power. And so in a way, it's not clear how it directly affects international law, a hard body of, it, of law. But I've been at conferences in Beijing where Chinese lawyers have been effectively asked to think about creatively how this concept can be injected into international legal discourse. And we're seeing some examples of that already. Um, for example, China's white paper on the Arctic published in 2018, which talks about regulation of activities in the Arctic and the international legal framework for that. Um, also uses the phrase the common shared future of mankind, as well as other well-known phrases like mutually beneficial cooperation. Perhaps more worryingly, we're also seeing the phrase crop up in the Human Rights Council, um, in particular a resolution in 2018, um, in which the language was uh, adopted um, in a resolution proposed by China. And on the face of it, the language seems actually pretty good. It's about the promotion of peace and harmony and the affirmation of the importance of human rights. But in other ways, it, it could underline, uh, undermine sorry, the, uh, the traditional language of human rights that's been built up through decades at the UN, in that it's a statist approach which promotes um, a regime in which states manage human rights between themselves, 
at the expense of the individual and at the expense of accountability of states and um, the ability for individuals to bring remedies against states. So there is concern that this language has been imported into Human Rights Council resolutions. There was a, um, another example in June this year where, where the language of mutually beneficial cooperation came in. Uh, and could this be undermining the existing um, approach to human rights that we've had since basically 1945? Um, final point, I would just conclude by saying that I think what's coming out of this in terms of global governance is that China's sovereigntist stance is starting to gain traction to some extent, perhaps in the tech governance space and in the Human Rights Council in certain quarters, just as, as China goes out into the, and, and becomes more active in the, in the multilateral space. And it's promoting a multilateral approach to, as opposed to a multi-stakeholder inclusive approach to governance at a time when many, particularly Western states, are trying to incorporate the, the views of private sector and, and civil society. But of course, this pro prominence, um, prominent emphasis on sovereignty is not confined to China and chimes pretty well with a rise in nationalism across the world. Let's not forget that here in the UK, we hear a lot about sovereignty in the context of Brexit. And I think I'll leave it uh, on that bombshell there, Kerry. Right. right. Uh, thank you very much. So we, we, we have, we're, what, 20 minutes in and we finally had the word Brexit. So I think this is the longest anyone at Chatham House has talked uh, in recent times without that word coming up uh, in the first 10 minutes. So I think we've done well. Great. Well, thank you both. Um, so I do, I mean, an initial question before we move on, I think we've already got some questions in the, in the dialogue box, but before I move to them, uh, I don't, I mean, the con construct of China, if we talk about that, the construct of this thing called China. So, I, I mean, in in 30 years of going to China, living in China, talking to Chinese colleagues and friends, I mean, it's always been very tempting to pick at this. And there's been a lot of literature about it. I, I, I mean, um, over the over the years, you know, the sort of sense in which it's a new country, but it's it sort of claims it's old. I mean, the People's Republic has existed since 1949, but of course it claims, you know, antecedents. And, and the history of those is, sure, very complicated. Um, and the Qing historians, you know, the new Qing history, that kind of phenomena sort of raises questions about that history and how neat it is. I mean, I guess if you look at this in a kind of uh, purely legalistic fashion, uh, it, it, it's something you really can pick apart. And I, I mean, there's all sorts of things that can be said about that and some of them have been said today. I find though over the years that emotionally, it's a compelling construct. And I guess I, I, my, my interest in, in your, your sort of comments would be on, you know, um, I, I can see many ways in which one can be skeptical and raise questions about this thing called China, just as one could be skeptical about this thing called Italy, uh, this thing called Germany, these are all very, very, they're all constructed. What country is not constructed? But I find it sort of emotional power to most of the people that, you know, you can talk to, um, uh, you know, kind of who say they're Chinese um, is, is very, very great. And the emotional power is, is not something that's constructed. It's something that's felt. I mean, you can construct a feeling, but I mean, it's, it's something that you really do directly feel. So I suppose my question is, is there some sort of slight suspicion that in working in this area, uh, in the ways we do as Western historian and analysts, we are subject to a bit of wishful thinking. And that is that if we kind of show that this is a construct and that it's something that has been, you know, in inverted commas invented, somehow the problems, this particular articulation of sovereignty, power, and the potency of that power regionally and internationally will be kind of diluted. You know, it kind of gets rid of that issue. If we can kind of win this argument that it's a construct, therefore we can deconstruct. And we hit, alas, a sort of really powerful emotional appeal by Chinese leaders at the moment that domestically, as far as I can see, really works. I mean, emotionally, I think this is not a construct. This really works. And you can have lots of conversations with Chinese interlocutors and non-Chinese interlocutors about, you know, the construct called China, and you will end up hitting the reality, uh, the emotional reality. So I suppose I'm interested in, in comments about how, how one can kind of deal with that sort of uh, anomaly, really, that kind of contradiction. Bill, Bill, maybe do you want to make some comments about that and, and anything else you want to talk about? 
I mean, uh, um, I think you right. Thank you. Um, I think you're absolutely right that um, just like other countries, uh, modern nation states are, are constructed. And you mentioned Italy, but you know, one could talk about Britain. Um, how how England and Scotland came together to form Britain, our sort of amnesia about Ireland, our strange relations with, with continental Europe. Um, <clears throat> but I kind of, I mean, I started to write it because I felt this discussion was absent when one talked about China, that somehow among our kind of general audience, there was a feeling that China was somehow different, that it was genuinely ancient and continuous and all the rest of it. And that all the, and the ideas that we have when we, we look at China now, Often people just assume that they have always been the same, you know, back 5,000 years. And so I wanted to look at this particular process, kind of the last decade or so of the 19th century and the early first two decades of the, the, the 20th century, to look at how these ideas were created and became so emotionally compelling. Because when you, when you go back and you look at how discussions were taking place in the late 19th century, you find all these nationalists basically saying, isn't it terrible how useless our people are? They don't believe in the nation. They're not emotionally compelled to it. Uh, they're all different. They're all speaking in different ways and none of them are loyal to the nation. And yet, you know, kind of here we are a century later and we have an emotionally compelling case um, where, you know, we have a belief in a homogenous nation, uh, you know, well-organized and, and, and motivated. Um, and, it's not a simple jump from, you know, from there to here. There, there, there was all kinds of contingency along the way. I mean, that I think is interesting in itself, but for me, I was interested in it because uh, a lot of this um, nation building underlies the problems or the issues that the world faces when it looks at China. So when you look at, you know, the situation in Tibet and Xinjiang, for example, or, um, you know, you, you have to understand these debates that took place about the nation back um, in the late 19th, early 20th century. You know, is there one Chinese nation or are there many Chinese nations? I mean, this, the Chinese word Minzu, you know, does it mean nation? Does it mean ethnic group? Um, and this is because ideas and concepts were translated from German and English and other languages into, in, you know, often into Japanese and then into Chinese. And in that translation process, future problems uh, were embedded um, and I you know the, and this the shift I think you know towards a, a more homogenous view of what China needs to be um, under Xi I kind of has links that go back all the way to Sun Yat-sen uh, around the turn of the century but they haven't always gone in one direction there have been debates about you know you know whether the country should be diverse um, or whether it should be uh, should be homogenous um, so I, I'm kind of, I'm not trying to sort of say that, you know, one day, uh, the Chinese people will sort of take the red pill and suddenly wake up and realize that they're not Chinese at all, but to sort of show how these feelings, you know, of uh, emotional bond were actually, you know, deliberately constructed, you know, partly by reformers and revolutionaries and then later by a Republican government and actually put the Republic, you know, into the center of this process rather than just sort of treating it as some kind of aberration between the end of the empire and, and the birth of the, the People's Republic. Great. Um, so just to be, so if, just, just one final question. So it seems like the process that you're describing, although it has all sorts of uh, local issues and particularities, is a generic one. It's something that other places have also gone through. The difference is, however, that it happens to be a country which is now powerful and economically, you know, kind of very powerful, that's the difference. But the actual process is a generic one, that this is something that other countries have been through. There's, there's not a specific thing that you're looking at that says, this is the Chinese kind of issue around Chinese construction of its, 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 its contemporary nationhood. Yes, I suppose in the, I mean, I don't want to kind of say that every, you know, modern nation state has gone through exactly the same process, but I mean, in general, you know, how Germany transformed from a, you know, collection of small states into a big power, how Turkey, I suppose is a better analogy, you know, went from being an Ottoman empire to being a modern, you know, if you, you can, can contrast, I mean, if China had gone the way that Turkey went, then it would have said goodbye to Tibet, Xinjiang, Mongolia, Manchuria, and you'd have just had a core, 
you know, kind of 15 provinces of the Ming state left behind in the same way that Ottoman Empire kind of lost its, quote, Arab provinces and, and you know, became a core Turkish uh, state. So, you know, those are, you know, I, I, either state could have gone in either direction, but I mean, you can see the two possible outcomes from that sort of nation building process there. Um, so yes, everyone is different, but in order to get to a modern state, a modern nation state where you have to define a nation and, and a state and its boundaries and, and its national myths, then yes, it's a generic process. Great, thanks so much. So I've got a question here, maybe Harriet could uh, also answer um, from uh, Ambre Barrier, I believe. Uh, will China's strong sense of sovereignty be a hindrance to tackling global environmental issues and an example of strong political drive and governance of the energy transition. So, uh, I mean, you know, in, in terms of the sort of Chinese state that we see now, it's it role in environmental issues. I mean, Xi Jinping, I think last month, I believe the UN making these statements. I mean, how do you interpret that within the kind of framework that you were describing earlier, Harriet, about this sort of very Chinese way of engaging with multilateral organizations now? Yeah, thanks, Kerry. I think in a way we've seen China being quite active in terms of environmental issues, but it's doing it um, on its own terms. And I thought that Bill's example of the nationally determined contributions is an is a interesting example of sort of China on the one hand engaging on the global stage and, you know, at Davos a few years ago, Xi Jinping exhorting states to actually get involved in climate change and like, uh, you know, basically taking this floor away from the US because there's a lack of leadership from the US and President Trump has not engaged in those issues, far from it. So Xi Jinping encouraging other states to get involved in the Paris uh, Agreement, but at the same time not wanting there to be an independent mechanism that reviews its own um, efforts. So it has to control the environmental situation within its own borders. Um, and I think that it was a missed opportunity uh, at Copenhagen, and that is a shame. Um, but I think China, on the other hand, it should be acknowledged, has been doing a lot on climate change in, within its own borders and, and globally compared to some states. I think there is a bit of an irony more generally that China is pushing a sort of very sovereigntist model based on territorial borders at a time when we're living in a world where many of the world's, a time when many of the world's problems are global. Um, I mean, we, environment is one obvious example where states have to work together and where environmental issues just go across borders. So there are many cases actually in the Inter-American court now um, where you know, fumes from one country are directly affecting the health of humans in another country. But there's also the, the issue I mentioned of tech governance. Obviously the internet um, is borderless effectively, um, but China's trying to create this cyber sovereignty in Russia too. And it's, it's spreading amongst quite a lot of countries where they're trying to kind of ring fence the internet in within their own borders, um, which kind of goes against this sort of multi-stakeholder borderless world that, um, that the, sort of the West would be trying to promote. And if I may carry just on your point about um, about I suppose the myth and uh, the, the book, the historical unpicking that, that Bill has done. I found it really interesting because there's another, there's a book on um, India called Anarchy by William Dalrymple in which he effectively tries to do the th same thing to say India was not a homogenous thing. When the East India Company came in it was the Mughal empire and it was very complicated. I think that's all good. But essentially, the, the historical lesson for me is the, is the history of colonialism, which has led to this kind of insecurity, this incredible desire to, to have independence. And that's a pattern that we see in many sort of formerly occupied states. Thank you. So there's a question here, I guess both of you probably be uh, uh, kind of positioned to answer about technology. So and China uh, has obviously been using technology in interesting ways, some of it positive, some of it maybe more problematic, um, you know, in mass instant communications, monitoring of people. I mean, COVID-19 has seen a lot of, you know, Chinese technology really coming to the fore, but also, of course, uh, you know, really, really problematic issues in Xinjiang. So uh, the question is, how does this deployment of technology and this capacity impact on the nation state concept in China? I mean, is it that China's sort of nationhood now is being really reinforced by the fact that it is a technology nation, you know, the digital nation, China, the digital, you know, kind of entity. Uh, Bill, what, what, what do you think about that? <laughs> That's a good one. I mean, does the ubiquity of WeChat increase homogeneity? Um, uh, I suppose, I mean, if you're talking about 
technology as a kind of a, a surveillance system, then it kind of allows you to um, main monitor and, and survey expression and therefore police the limits of expression. Um, I wonder whether you think of WeChat in the same way that Sun Yat-sen thought about railways um, as a way that you know kind of brings people together and unites and unites them and allows you know rapid travel of ideas across the space of the state. Um, yeah, I'm kind of sorry. I'm sort of I'm, I'm, <laughs> I, I'm, that's about as far as I think I'm going to go on this. I'm going to meet Harriet's got some 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 better ideas. You, you probably got some better ideas yourself, frankly, Kerry. <laughs> <laughs> Five thousand years of WeChat. What a, there's, there's, there's you go. There's, there's a my God. What a, what an amazing view. <laughs> yes, Harriet. What do you think? Did, did digital, uh, you know, digital prowess and nationhood. Do these go together well? Are they reinforcing? On the one hand, as I say, no. In the sense that digital is this global concept, and it's quite hard, I think, to work out how you apply nation uh, barrier nation borders onto that. But China has, you know, from the inception, really done that with the Great Firewall. And I think there's a real dilemma for China because. A lot of the internet raises issues of um, civil and political rights. And so, you know, the Human Rights Councillor says that um, human rights applies online as it applies offline. Um, but China, as I said, places more emphasis on economic and social rights and lifting its people out of poverty and the right to development. So there's this issue where people can see around the world that, that the internet is a big thing, that people are using their smartphones. And yet some portions of the world can only use it in a very limited way. And so, you know, you kind of wonder where that's going to go. Um, eventually, will people push back on that? There was an app that was launched called Tuba recently uh, by China, I think by a Chinese company anyway, that was trying to perhaps maybe open up a bit more in terms of what Chinese citizens could access, but it's already apparently been shut down. So I think, you know, these debates as well create geopolitical issues. We look at TikTok in the US. Um, but certainly China, one thing I would say is that on the international law stage, China is very much more active. We're seeing China in the ITU trying to set technological standards. We know that China is a global technology leader. The question is, how does that fit with a very control sort of state centric ideology? And it's hard to know where that's going to go. There's a real battle, this splinter net battle in the UN at the moment. Great. I mean, so there's quite a few questions about the sort of kinds of language that China state actors are using now, the kind of phenomena of, you know, China being pretty confident, some even use the word arrogant. Uh, I think Bill also, you know, in the book, in his book, and, and also just in the talk refers to sort of this almost like vassal kind of state, state as given to, to some countries. Um, I think Yang Jiechi, the Chinese uh, kind of formerly Minister of Foreign Affairs a few years ago, made this famous comment about small countries. And, you know, this was really, really uh, uh, worried people. So there's questions about this issue of, you know, is China an arrogant power? <laughs> Does it, is, is, the, is the thing that kind of um, worries people in the region and the world, uh, the idea that this, you know, sort of state model that China has with its appeals to kind of a deep history and all the rest of it, actually becoming a, a kind of um, platform for fairly arrogant behavior or assertive behavior and wolf warriors and this kind of thing. Um, and how that kind of plays with a United States that is also using some, pre some pretty strong language pushing back. So would you categorize China as a, um, you know, kind of a, a sort of being arrogant or is there another more appropriate way of understanding the kind of language it uses at the moment? I guess, Bill, yeah, would, would you maybe sort of- I wonder whether we go to Edward Lutwax idea of the uh, of great power autism um, I don't know whether we're allowed to use that still now um, you know, but I mean it's you know the idea that states behave in certain ways without and, and the bigger they are the less they notice about the world and you know around them the more inwardly focused they are um, the more they go sort of stum stumbling around and, and treading on people and, and things without necessarily being aware of what they're stumbling over um, and um, clearly when as you say, that comment, you know, um, by Yang at the ASEAN Regional Forum in, in 2010, when apparently he was looking directly at the Foreign Minister of Singapore when he said it, um, was um, you know was taken in Southeast Asia as being a very worrying moment that China was going to start behaving like a big power and that small states just basically had to get used to it and kind of line up in in, in the hierarchy. Um, so yeah, I think 
it doesn't necessarily mean that it's a well thought out policy. It could just be the way that, that big countries behave. And, and as you say, you know, the, the world where seem to be, well, let's see what happens in early November. But I mean, are we going to end up with, you know, two big, you know, kind of uh, untethered powers kind of roaming around and forcing everybody else to line up uh, in hierarchies, you know, around them. Um, and, you know, speaking personally, this just seems to be the worst time in history when, you know, a medium sized country like Britain might detach itself from a community of, um, you know, uh, in people that, or states that have an interest in, in rules and, and, and shared sovereignty and, and all the rest of it. Um, but I, it's not just the, um, I think when you look at, I'm looking for kind of clues in how China behaves, which kind of tell us something about the organizing principles. And when one looks at something, for example, like the 16 plus one arrangement, where China has built these, um, this relationship with countries in Central and Eastern Europe, most of which are in the EU, but some of which aren't. And it's a way, it seems to be a way of dealing with these countries, which deliberately, or at least the, the Europeans have taken huge offense at this, you know, the, kind of the, um, the, the European Union, the European Commission, almost as like a weapon to try and destroy the EU in some ways. But rather than kind of rolling back, you know, China has kind of rolled forward with it. Um, I was at a conference, an online conference a few days ago, and someone said, well, maybe we could invite the EU to be the 17th partner in this, you know, so that, you know, sort of now China is now, or it wasn't China, this was obviously, this was an academic or somebody speaking, you know, well, treat the EU as just another sovereign state, you know, kind of along with Slovakia. Um, you know, when it does, when something like that happens, and I think then, you know, we are talking about um, a degree of unthinkingness, which upsets people probably unnecessarily. Just, I mean, with Bill, we can't ever have a discussion without the nine dash line, the nine dash line coming in. So we do have a question about that. And what you've just said, I mean, do you think, so the nine dash, what does the nine dash line in the South China Sea area and the things that China sort of claims about that and does about that. And this is something obviously you've written a lot about in your previous book to say about Chinese views of sovereignty. I mean, we know a lot about land sovereignty with China, but maritime sovereignty, this is obviously a, a much trickier area. So in view of the sort of Chinese state behavior you're describing, the nine dash line, where does it sit in all of that? Is it a new development or, you know, something different? I think there's, there's one good thing about sort of, uh, Chinese uh, actions about territory, which is that there is a line around it. You might disagree with the line, um, and there's a line in the Himalayas, which obviously India disagrees with you know, profoundly, but there's a line. <laughs> so it's not, I mean, if I sort of make a comparison, say with uh, the Germany of the 1930s, where there's this sort of vague sense that it's just gonna keep on expanding or whatever, that, that China has a, it seems a very specific attitude to territory, a defined attitude, and we can sort of argue about how that line came to be drawn, whether it was drawn on a rational basis and whatever, but there's a line. Yeah? Um, we can't, we don't think that China's suddenly going to kind of roll into northern India and claim that it's, you know, part of the, um, uh, you know, the, the ancestral homeland or whatever. Um, so, yeah, I mean, my argument with the, with the nine dash line is that it, you know, it emerges out of a series of, of misunderstandings in the 1930s. Um, based on wishful thinking and, and, and it's very much an emotional connection and it was forged at specific moments in 1930s when China is uh, facing uh, Japan, uh, invasions from Japan and is also worried about France as, as the colonial power in Indochina and it becomes a marker, it becomes a way of saying you know we are defending the country, we are going to stick our flag in these islands and so forth. The problem, of course, is that in 1933, the Chinese government mixes up the Paracels and the Spratly Islands and the, and the claim kind of extends, you know, by, by mistake. Um, so there are kind of good things and bad things. I don't know enough about the kind of Himalayan border to say whether the same process of mistake, you know, is, was involved there. Um, but um, I suppose what is left, you know, what's left is a kind of sense in a kind of corporate emotion, you know, kind of a body politic and, and the upper echelons of the state is that, you know, an emotional importance of doing something about this territory, that there is there is yeah. no grounds to compromise there. Thank you very much. So I guess the final question really to Harriet, I guess, to, to sort of, because it's a one that your external perspective would be really helpful on. I mean, this claim that China has captured international relations, international institutions or multilateral institutions, you know, it's got sort of heads of UN bodies and things now. I mean, do you think that is something that is 
highly strategic? And is it a problem? And if so, what kind of a problem is it uh, in view of what Bill has been talking about? Yeah, thanks, Kerry. Um, I think, you know, China's influence has grown on the international stage and it has got more backing through its relationships with countries where it is um, providing in, in investment, including the, there are 70 Belt and Road Initiative countries, as we know. Um, and so we're starting to see, you know, for example, the UN Human Rights Council resolution that went through in June, 23 states voting in favor, 16 against with eight abstentions. We're starting to see different camps um, and there are alliances which are uh, opposing some of China's positions on sovereignty and human rights, for example. Um, so I think there is some pushback going on and there's, there's a sort of a desire in the West at least to sort of push this sort of liberal open uh, vision of, of the internet, as I've said. And I think there's also to maybe a bit of calling out of China's emphasis on the principle of non-intervention, given how active it is in other countries. Um, I mean, there was always this discourse by China about the arrogance of the West in its sort of um, human rights imperialism and attaching conditions to its aid and that kind of thing in favor of um, you know, requiring adherence to certain human rights and democratic uh, rules. Um, and China doesn't attach those conditions, but you get the sense that there is some sort of trade-off required at the same time. And so if China is going to push the principle of non-intervention, then I think we have to make sure that it lives up to that. Um, and I think a lot of countries are watching that quite carefully. Uh, and finally, I think, you know, on the situation in Xinjiang and the, the abuses there, there is um, a resolution, I think, this week, which Germany has proposed with 39 states backing it to try and have an independent um, investigation, including the Human Rights Commission are going to visit that area. So these are examples of some pushback against um, uh, some of the attempts by China, I think, to assert its sovereignty in the human rights space. Great. Well, look, thank you very much. Unless we are uh, out of time, uh, it's uh, a very short period to discuss a very, very rich and interesting subject. So I'm really grateful. Bill's book, The Invention of China, uh, comes out with Yale University Press, I believe, tomorrow. Uh, so congratulations. It's a really important subject and really valuable to have more discussion about it. And so I think Bill makes a really uh, a positive and, and helpful contribution. Um, thank you for my colleagues, uh, Harriet and Bill, today for discussing these issues. Uh, sorry for the questions we couldn't answer. Um, and I don't mean the questions we've just tried to answer, but also the questions that didn't get answered because I couldn't ask them. Uh, I'm very grateful for everyone to take part in the, um, uh, this event today. And I uh, hope we'll be seeing you either in person or online very uh, uh, really soon. Thank you very much.